I could find a way to get inside of your head and tell you what a great deal this is. I've been waiting a while for this. It's my privilege to welcome you. Would you stand and welcome the man and woman of God to this platform? Michael and the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I know you've been worshiping, but can we just lift our hands one more time? Just worship the Lord a moment. Hallelujah. We welcome you again, Holy Spirit. Mm, this is your house. Father, this is your place. Jesus, this is your place. We welcome you again to your place. Hallelujah. 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 Mm, it's more than a song, Lord. It's the desire of our hearts that we could be taken by you into a realm, Lord, that we have never been. Take us to places we have never been. Hallelujah. 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 Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Jesus. 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 Oh. It's a little chorus, a little song that uh, we picked up from the nation in New Zealand. I'll give you a background on that in a moment. It defines, I think, one of the absolute keys for receiving anything from the Lord. The song says, I'm hungry for you. There is, my, my father used to say that you could be satisfied with an unsatisfiable satisfaction. That in Jesus, everything that you need, that you would find the more of Him that you have, the more of Him that you want. That the more the touch of the Spirit of God that you experience, the more the touch of the Spirit of God you desire. I've made the observation over the years that genuine revival can absolutely ruin somebody because you are never satisfied again with anything less than an encounter again with the presence of God. And uh, Linda's going to sing this little chorus, and as she sings it, uh, and begin to pick it up with her, just join with us and sing. It says, I'm hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. Hungry for you. So hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. So hungry for you. So hungry for you. Needing your touch, just the touch of your hand. I'm needing your touch. Just the touch of your hand. Shower down your sweet, sweet rain. Shower down your sweet, sweet rain on my thirsty Just sing it one more time from the top, Linda. I'm hungry for you. So hungry, so hungry, Lord. So hungry for you. So hungry for you today. I'm hungry for you. 
so hungry for you. So hungry for you. I'm needing your touch. I'm needing your touch. Just the touch of your hand. Just the touch of your hand. Shower down your sweet, sweet rain. Shower down your sweet, sweet rain. On my thirsty land. On my thirsty land. morning Lord Jesus what we want is you nothing more nothing less nothing else we want you we want you thank you Jesus hallelujah You may be seated if you would like. Would you stand with me? Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing would he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I'm going to ask you to pray a little prayer with me if you would. I'm going to ask everybody to pray this. Heavenly Father, open my heart that I may hear what you would say to me. Change my life. Make me more like Jesus. In his precious name. Amen. You may be seated. We have looked forward to being with you. Had the privilege back in the dark ages. Uh, that's where I met first met Pastor Keith. He was traveling as an evangelist out of here. And we had the privilege of being um, a part of a, was it, that thing went about 20 weeks or something total? And I think we were here about six, seven of those weeks and just a wonderful, wonderful time. And so some of your faces look familiar. And some of you, this will be our first opportunity to meet you. And we're looking forward to that. James chapter 4 and verse 17 declares God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Giving is an essential part of the nature of God. In Matthew chapter 7 and Luke chapter 11, we are told that if we can overcome evil and give good gifts, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good things, including the Holy Spirit, to them that ask Him? He has no evil nature to overcome. It is an essential part of who he is to be a giver. Now, our text describes two things that God desires to give to us. Grace and glory. In the message this morning, I want to focus on, this, on the subject of grace. And if God helps us, we'll get to glory perhaps this evening. But before going into the message, I want to look uh, at a summary a thought that I, I wrote from Psalm 84, 11 in my, in my Bible program, in my, own, in my own notes. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The New Living Translation says, our light and protector. The Lord provides illumination and direction for us. He is the one who protects us. He gives grace and glory. New Living Translation simply says, he gives us grace and glory. This phrase both ministers to me and fires up my imagination. 
God grants me His grace. Salvation comes from His grace. Because of salvation's grace, I will experience eternity's glory. Grace also speaks to me of favor. And glory speaks of honor. God delights in giving both favor and honor to His children. Glory also speaks of a revelation of the essence of God. When you have experienced His grace, you can also have opportunity to experience His glory. No good thing with He withholds and then they walk uprightly. Whenever you feel like the Lord has told you no, you ever had God say no to you? When God says no to you, you can be very encouraged. And he says, that sounds strange. No, if God says no, it's because he has something else much better in mind for you. Years ago, there's not in my notes, it's dangerous to do this. We'd only been traveling as evangelists a very short time, maybe a year or less. And I was preaching at a church and they had stayed away by the hundreds. I think the crowd, the largest crowd was 13. That counted myself, my wife, my two kids, the pastor, his wife, and his two kids. And, you know, and so whatever else that left, you know. And I had preached one night on missions and preached myself under conviction. And so at the response time, at the altar time, as people were just seeking the Lord, I was laying on my face in the back of the platform. And I was saying, oh, God, would you call me to the mission field? God, would you let me go to the mission field? And very clearly and distinctly, I heard him say, no. No. You're doing what I want you to do. And so I just shelved it. I said, okay. You know, and I just and spent the next, uh, that point, about you know, 15, 16 years uh, traveling in the States, ministering in the States. I just assumed that's what I would do the rest of my life. And I won't get into the whole story this morning because it's too long. But God, in a very sovereign way, opened the doors for us to go to New Zealand in 1999 and and actually to attend an event. And out of that, God made it very clear that we're to go back to the nation. And we went for what we thought would be a little six-week tour. And the sixth week of that tour is in a church in the suburbs of the nation's capital. And, and what was scheduled for four days became one of those God moments. Uh, Twenty weeks later, 800 people had responded to a salvation invitation. Hundreds of people had been filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the pastor said to me, he said, there was never a month for five years uh, that I did not hear a story of something God did that I had never heard before of what God did. In fact, pastors of that city will say that that meeting was a catalyst for what it is that God is doing in that city. Church attendance in the city has doubled in the last decade. Uh, And and in a a nation that's been called the most secular society on planet earth, uh, that that city, church attendance has doubled in it. uh, Right across the board, almost every church you go to, I talk to the pastor, what were you running uh, in church 10, 12 years ago? What are you running now? And always, the number they give me almost always is nearly double, sometimes more than that, uh, of what they were running. Uh, And God did something uniquely wonderful very powerful in that but in the middle of that God said to me do you remember the night I said no he said yeah he said you thought I forgot that night but I never did he said you were here partially because of that night he said no to the way that I was thinking about it because he had something better in mind and when God says no to you it's not because God is against you it's because God has something for you that is better than you have for you and if you will learn to trust him in those moments uh, and walk in the way that he has for you, you will find that the better thing that he has for you, you'll be so glad and so thankful to God that you let God say no in order that he could say yes. Now let's focus on the grace that God wants to give you. For those interested in this sort of stuff, the word translated grace in Psalm 84, 11, occurs 69 times in the Old Testament. It's translated in the King James grace 38 times. It's translated favor 26 times. It's something that can be given by God to an individual or given by an individual to an individual. You can give somebody grace. You can give somebody favor. The very first time the word grace appears in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 8. Noah found grace. 
in the eyes of the Lord. And you can be very thankful for that. For may I tell you this morning, friend, had Noah not found grace in the eyes of the Lord, you would not be here. One of the first people I intend to visit in heaven is Noah. And I want to say, Noah, thanks, man. Thanks that in a world of wickedness that you made a decision to just live for God and to do it the right way. And because of that, Noah found grace in God's eyes and all of humanity was saved. Now, the scripture says in Genesis 6, 3, my spirit uh, shall not always strive with man. To strive with man can mean the following. Darby translation, shall not always plead with man. The idea is you can come to a point uh, where God is no longer speaking to you. That conviction no longer comes upon you. Some years back, I was in a meeting that God had graced. And there was a gentleman who came into a service one evening. By the second song, he was shaking under conviction. He was sitting toward the rear of the auditorium. He was shaking under conviction. I turned to the pastor and said, You know, there are people in this room who are ready to give their lives to Jesus right now. And he said, Well, don't mess it up with your preaching. I appreciated his support. I went to the pulpit and I said, there are those in this room that you were under conviction. God is speaking to you. There is sin in your life. It's time for you to give your life to Jesus. We're going no further in the service. I'm going to ask you to come now and give your life to Jesus. Twelve people came, included this man. And his story we found was this. Uh, the night before, and he, and he in his home, he was one of the leading drug dealers of the city. And in his home the night before, God began to speak to him. And God said this to him, I want you to be in my house tomorrow. Give your life to me or I will never speak to you again. Now I know there are some who struggle with that theologically, but don't tell Jeff that because he heard the voice. He heard God say, I'm done playing games with you. I'm done messing around. My spirit is not going to always plead with you. It's time for you to commit your life to me now. Now, I'm going to urge you. I'm going to plead with you not to resist the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That when the Spirit of God begins to draw you to Him, I'm going to encourage you to say yes to that. The NIV says, will not contend with man forever, suggesting the same thing. The New Revised Standard Version says, uh, will not abide in mortals forever, suggesting that God was going to limit man's lifespan. In Genesis 6, 5, God said that the wickedness of man is described as great, and the imagination of the thoughts of his heart as evil continually. So as a result, in in verse 6, God's heart is grieved, and he repents over having created man. That was, he was sorry, he regretted he had ever made man. To grieve also carries the thought of carving. It's like you get the picture at Thanksgiving when you're taking the carving knife and you're carving the turkey. It's that very same thought that that the sin of mankind was carving the heart of God. You need to understand, friend, that sin is no little thing. That when I live in sin, it does something to the heart of God. That when you do things that violate His Word, it does something to Him. It brings pain into His life when you sin against Him. Somebody says, well, it's not bothering anybody else. It's not hurting anybody else. Don't kid yourself. Sin hurts you. Sin hurts those around you. And sin hurts God. And the heart of God had been carved by the sin of mankind. And so in verse 7, God says, I'm going to destroy all of creation. I'm going to wipe the whole thing out. Verse 8, Noah finds grace. And God says, okay, I'll hold on that. Now, there was an action on Noah's part that brought God's favor. God's love for you is without reservation. God loves you whether you like it or not. It doesn't make any difference. You are loved. But his favor is offered to us. We have a part to play. God can offer favor and I can turn it down. God can offer me his, his, you know, all this. But I can say, I don't want it, God. So God's 
offered grace to Noah because of something God saw in Noah's life. God wants to give you grace today. It's his gift. He wants you to experience grace from him. Now, how is grace described in, in, in the New Testament? Acts chapter 4, verse 33 describes it as great grace. In Romans 3, 24, it's redemptive grace. In Romans 5 and 17, it's abundant grace. Romans 5 and 20, it's abounding grace. In 2 Corinthians 9 and 8, it's all grace. Exceeding grace is the description in 2 Corinthians 9, 14. In 1 Timothy 1 and 14, the Apostle Paul gets so excited, he says it's exceeding abundant grace. In 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, the grace is sufficient. In James 4 and 6, it's more grace. In 1 Peter 4 and 10, it's manifold grace. God's word is described as the word of his grace in Acts 14, 3. And he confirms that word of his grace with signs and wonders following. It's grace. But how does God want to give this grace to you? When God says, I want to give you grace, what does that mean? When he says, I'm going to give you sufficient grace and abundant grace and abounding grace uh, and and all grace. uh, What's God talking about? What is it that he's offering to invest into our lives out of his grace? Number one, there is saving grace. Acts chapter 15, verse 11. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. There were those who thought that only the Jews could be saved. When when Peter preached that message, there were those who said, the only people that can come into the kingdom of God are of Jewish descent. But Peter argues by the Holy Spirit that both Jews and Gentiles came to Jesus the same way, that it was through grace that they are saved, and through grace we are saved. Salvation is not the result of your bloodline. You see, you are not saved because of who your family is. You're not saved because you can go back four generations of preachers. And neither are you not saved. Neither are you kept out of the kingdom of God because of who your family is. I probably shouldn't tell any of this story today because I may want to tell it later. When my father gave his life to Jesus at age 19... He did not come out of a situation that was very encouraging. You see, my grandfather on my father's side was an alcoholic. My my grandfather on my father's side was a wife beater. My grandfather on my father's side sexually molested every one of his daughters. It's not a proud chapter in our family's history, but it's the facts. In that environment, my father grew up. My father said his family was so dysfunctional. Now, even dysfunctional families called them dysfunctional. You know, dad said they were so poor. He said we had four rooms and a path. You know, he just grew up in that environment. uh, And yet the grace of God uh, was not hindered by the fact uh, of who my father's father was. The grace of God didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't save you. I know what your background is. You see, you are not limited because of your past. And you are not helped because of somebody else's in your history. You are saved because of the grace of God. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. God's grace makes salvation available to you, to everyone in this room. In fact, I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to tell them God wants to grace you. In fact, tell them God wants to save you. God wants you in heaven. See, that's what God wants for you, friend. And in a few moments, if you have not yet experienced the grace of God that brings salvation, I want you to have an opportunity to experience God's grace in your life. No matter how much you may feel like you don't deserve it. I've had people say to me, but preacher, you don't understand what I did in Vietnam. You don't know what my past is. You don't understand the things I've been involved with. Let me tell you something, friend. He is a bigger Savior than you are, sinner. (laughs) 
There is not a sin that you can name that I have not heard named, that I have not seen Jesus forgive. I prayed with the murderers. I prayed with alternate lifestyles. I prayed with people involved with bestiality, okay? I mean, I've seen, and the grace of God covers your sin. Titus chapter 3, verse 7, they're being justified by His grace. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Uh, Notice that grace provides justification. I love that word. If you want to know what it means, just break it up. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's what it means. Michael, when God looks at you, He says, I've never seen any sin in His life. Because when he looks at you, he sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, through the grace of God. It's just as if you had never committed any sin in your life. The Apostle Paul says, one place you can receive me because I've done no wrong. Somebody said, wait a minute, Paul. Wait, wait one minute. I know what you did before you got saved. You were hauling people off to prison. You stood there when they stoned Stephen to death. You were cheering them on. But you see, Paul understood justification. He understood that though he had done that, but because of the grace of God, that God did not remember what Paul had ever done before. And friend, when Satan reminds you of your past, you need to let him know he's got a bad memory because God doesn't see it. As a result, grace makes us heirs of eternal life. You're going to live forever, friend, because of grace. It's not only saving grace, there's believing grace. In Acts 18 and 27, Apollos was a great help to those who by grace had believed. Now, God will actually give you the grace to believe. You see, my grandfather, the one that I mentioned with all that sordid past, my, my father would talk to him about giving his life to Jesus, and he would say to my father's son, he will not accept me. He will not forgive me because his past was bearing on him. He knew what he had done. He would say, but God cannot forgive me. But one year before his death, God granted him believing grace. And God gave him a grace to believe the simple promise of salvation. And he reached out to God and he asked him to forgive him of his sin. And the lifetime of alcoholism and wife abuse and child abuse was washed away under the blood of Jesus Christ. And in the last year of his life, my grandfather was a radically changed individual because of the grace of God that came into his life. And when he did not have the ability to believe, grace gave him the ability to believe. This same truth is revealed in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Salvation is not of yourself. It is God's grace gift. It is his Favor to you. But not only does salvation come from his favor, so does faith to believe. He puts faith to believe in your heart that though you have sins in your life, that you can be forgiven. In a few moments, friend, I want you to have the opportunity of experiencing believing grace. And I want you to have the opportunity of experiencing saving grace wherever you may be in this building. I want you to have the opportunity of experiencing God's grace that saves. There's also sanctifying grace. Acts chapter 20 verse 32 speaks of the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. To be sanctified means basically two things. It's to be sold out to God and to be separated from sin. Now, notice there's a role for the Word. He said that it was the Word of His grace. The more time you spend with the Word of God, the more that Word changes you. Yeah. Sometime back, I had a guy at a meeting who said to me, I just, I, just don't, you know, I just don't believe that Jesus is God's Son. And, and, and I don't know. I just had this impression. I said, you're an honest man, aren't you? He said, well, I'd like to think that I am. I said, would you do a little test for me? He said, well, if I can. 
I said, would you, uh, would you take your Bible? You have a Bible? I said, yeah, I got one somewhere. I said, would you go to the Gospel of John and, and just read just read it? Just see what happens. He said, I can do that. So he's back the next night. I said, did you read today? He said, yeah. I said, I did. I said, he said, yeah. I said it's strange. He says, I felt something happening inside of me. I said, keep reading. I said, keep reading. The next night, he said, yes, son, keep reading. The third night, I give an invitation for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He came. So I got to him the prayer. I said, I want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I said, good. It begins like this. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. <laughs> and he went to not believing that Jesus, just through the word of God, as he was reading God's word, something began to happen to him. But there's also a role of God's grace. Or his favor. It builds you up. The foundation has been laid. And now the grace of God builds up a spiritual house. You've come into the kingdom of God. You've gotten saved. The foundation is there. And now God wants to build you into a spiritual house for his glory. And grace is a part of the building. He gives you an inheritance. God's grace is giving you a share in his kingdom. It's better than any share on any stock market in the world because it never goes down. That share will be worth more a thousand years from now than it is today and a million years from now. That share will be worth more. He gives you a share. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 and 12. God's grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. And worldly lust. And live soberly, righteously, and godly. In this present world. We're taught to deny two things. Ungodliness. That is godless living. Living as if there is no God. And we're taught to deny worldly lust or desires. This speaks of a passion for that which is forbidden. Here's what I discover. When I'm living in God's favor, when I'm experiencing God's grace, the desire to not engage in what hurts him increases. Can I say that again? When I'm living in God's grace, when I'm walking in his favor, the desire to not do the things that hurt him increases. I love this lady on the front row that I've been married to since 19... 74. Wow. She's not getting old, but I am. 36 years. I don't want to do anything that hurts her. I don't come into that relationship out of fear of her. I'm bigger than she is. But out of grace, out of love, I don't want to do things that will cause her hurt and pain in her life. And when I receive, God, I've received her grace. And it caused me to want to respond in a way that I would never respond to, to threats. But when she graces me, there's something inside. What can I do for you? And God wants you to walk in his grace. We're also taught to embrace a threefold lifestyle in this world. We're taught to live soberly. Modern King James says discreetly. New American Standard says sensibly. NIV, self-controlled. That's good. We're taught to live righteously. That's upright, NIV, or right conduct, NLT. We're taught to live godly. Murdoch translation, fear of God. New Living Translation, devoted to God. That's what grace does in our lives, sanctifying grace. It's an ongoing process in your life. In a few moments, you can come to the altar. And may I say this about the altar air, the front of the building? It's your friend. Well, I don't know if I go down there to the front. Somebody's going to wonder what I've been doing. <laughs> no, they won't. You're not that big a deal. I had a lady in my church one time who said to me, well, you know, I'm not coming to church right now because I'm, I'm just kind of really depressed and discouraged. If I come to church, I might depress somebody. I really want to say, come on out, sis. You don't have that much influence. <laughs> but I figured that depressed her worse, so I didn't say that. I want to 
come to the altar, I'm giving God opportunity. Oh, I give him opportunity every day in my personal prayer. But I've discovered there's just something special. In these seasons, I can come in the house of the Lord where there's a special something from God, an anointing that's flowing. And I can get there in that altar and that anointing and say, God, would you give me sanctifying grace? Would you purify me today? Would you make me more like Jesus today? Would you do something inside of me today that begins to transform me and make me into the image of your dear son? I was giving an invitation one time at a church and somebody said to me, you made it sound like if I didn't go to the altar that I didn't love Jesus. I said, I'm glad you got the message. <laughs> there's a fourth grace. There's giving grace. 2 Corinthians 8, 7, grace enables us to be givers. In a season of great affliction and deep poverty, the grace of God enabled the believers of Macedonia to become liberal in their giving. Now, Paul encourages Timothy and, 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 and I'm sorry, encourages Titus uh, to finish in you the same grace also. Paul desires God's grace to complete a giving grace in the church. He urges the church to abound in the grace. He said, You've done well. With faith and utterance and knowledge and diligence and love. He said, now add to that, uh, that you be abounding in this grace as well. He says, this isn't a command. He said, I'm not twisting your arm behind your back. He said, but I want you to consider the example of Jesus. He said, I want you to consider the example of others. And I want you to let God's grace enable you to become gracious givers. Do I have to tie? You get to give. God wants to give you a grace where it's a delight and a joy. Say, oh Lord, how much can I give? How much can I share with you, Lord? We move on. There is strengthening grace. Hebrews 4 and 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's throne is a place of favor. You are not overcoming his reluctance. You're not somehow, no, no, you're connecting with his favor. You're not twisting God's arm behind his back. But when you come to him with your need, you're connecting with the favor of God that delights in ministering to you. This grace provides two things. Mercy. That's not receiving what you deserve. I do not want to receive what I deserve. Then there was the preacher early in his ministry, and he had been preaching someplace and didn't think they had done very well by him. The offering was pretty pathetic. He's leaving the town kind of complaining to God about the way they had treated him. And God said, Now nah, you got more than you deserve. And then God said, You deserved hell. He said it changed his life. So no matter what happened in life, it's more than I deserve. Mercy. Grace gives you mercy. And the grace gives you help in time of need. What a beautiful expression. For we all have times of need, spiritual needs, emotional needs, physical needs, financial needs. And His favor gives us help. In a few moments, I'm going to give you an invitation to come to the altar. And some have a physical need. And you're going to come relying upon God's grace that heals. You have an emotional need. And you're going to come relying on God's grace that heals. You have a financial need. You come relying on God's grace. You have a spiritual need. It's God's grace. Let me move on. There is liberating grace. For grace gives us an established heart in Hebrews 13 and 9. Same passage, 20th century New Testament. Do not let yourselves be carried away by the various novel forms of teaching. It is better to rely for spiritual strength upon the divine help than upon regulations regarding food. For those whose lives are guarded by such regulations have not found them of service. Legalism easily makes its way into Christian experience. We slip into following certain codes. Colossians describes it as taste not, touch not, handle not. 
Spirituality begins to be measured by certain external things. Length of your hair. When I was a kid growing up, you know, if your hair got to the ears, you definitely were not spiritual. If you were a lady and your hair got above your ears, you were not spiritual. Clothes. Diet. Listen, what, your, your diet does not make you more spiritual. It may take you to heaven quicker, but it doesn't make you more spiritual. Some of you get that tomorrow. He says, it's better to rely on God's grace for your spiritual strength. Let your heart be established or made stable through his grace. And then he makes this observation. He said, the other doesn't work anyway. He said, you're not profited by it. Those who struggle and strain and struggle to keep all of the regulations and the requirements only to find they keep coming up short. So he says, why don't you just rely on my grace and let me do it through you. And you discover that I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now let me prepare to bring this thing in for a landing. I've been very positive to this point, so let me give you the sting in the tail, okay? To reject God's grace has potential disastrous consequences. Hebrews 10, 29, of how much sore or punishment. Suppose you should he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God, hath counted the blood of the covenant, where he was sanctified an unholy thing, hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. I do not want to make this the focus, but I can't avoid this verse either. You see, God's grace, God's favor offers salvation. It offers liberation. It offers help for you today. But if the grace is refused, there are consequences. We're reminded in the passage that those who despise, that is rejected or set aside, or did not obey the law of Moses, died without mercy. The rejection of God's call for reconciliation, for you to be restored to Him. You see, God is constantly seeking to have you restored to Him. Friend, it's not that you were seeking for God. God was seeking for you. You see, it wasn't the lost lamb that was looking for the shepherd. The shepherd was looking for the lost lamb. And he's been looking for you, friend. And he's given you this invitation, this offer to be restored to him. But if I reject that, I create the possibility of a sore or punishment. One translation says capital punishment. Listen how God describes the actions of those who reject salvation's plan. They've trodden underfoot the Son of God. That is, they've trampled down, they've rejected with disdain. They've counted the blood an unholy thing. Ain't no big deal. That's what they were saying. To the Jewish mindset, to say it was common, was to say that it was not worthy of being brought into the tabernacle. You couldn't bring that blood in. But it was that blood that made it possible for you to experience eternity's glory. It was that blood that made it possible for you to experience salvation's grace. To reject that blood. To say that blood is of no value, that I don't need that blood. Is to cut off the only source you have for forgiveness. And then he says this, and they've done despite, they've insulted the spirit of grace. Now, I don't like that verse of scripture because it doesn't fit well in our politically correct society. Just always make me feel good. But I can't get away from that verse of scripture. That at some point God says, you need to understand, I'm giving favor, I'm giving grace to you, but the rejection of it God says has high consequences. Coming in for the landing now. It's in the heart of God to move with grace towards you today. He wants to grace you. Look at the person next to you and say to them again, God wants to grace you. And that grace is exceeding abundant. 
it's sufficient. It's more than enough. His grace towards you is not limited unless you limit it. That grace is to bring you the following. Salvation. You can receive this free gift in just a moment. It's to receive sanctification. You can come and allow Him by His grace to deepen a work of His purity in your heart, making you more like Jesus. His grace will bring generosity into your life. His grace will bring you strength and help. You may be struggling today with an area in your life, but you can receive His grace today to help you physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. His grace provides liberation. Condemnation may have set in. Legalism may be crowding in in your life, but today you can experience the freedom and liberation from His grace. Not a license to sin, but a freedom in His grace not to sin. Would you stand with me, please? It's been a great morning in the house of God. But potentially the greatest part of this day is just in front of you. I'm not interested in just giving a speech. A lady said to me, one day, that's a nice speech, sir. I just preached my guts out. She says, it's a nice speech. I wanted to slap her. I didn't, but I just wanted to. I'm preaching for a target. I want you to have an encounter with God's grace today. Now, I can speak words of grace, and I can ask God to release His grace. But at some point, grace doesn't happen until you make yourself available where God can grace you. And for those in this room that you need to experience the grace of having your sins forgiven, salvation's grace. I wish I could find a way to get inside of your head and tell you what a great deal this is that God wants to give you. To have your sins forgiven. Wow. To stand before the Almighty clean. And all you have to do is walk about 30 feet and say, Jesus, would you forgive me? Father, would you give me your grace that saves He is more ready to save you than you are to be forgiven. And in just a moment, I'm going to open this altar and invite you to come and experience forgiveness, experience saving grace. There are others in this room, when I mention sanctifying, purifying grace, it's like something just kind of leaped inside you because God, you've been struggling, and God, beginning today, wants to increase something in your life. I tell people, I don't understand. We we were in a meeting, that meeting went 20 weeks in New Zealand, and the pastor called and said, why is this meeting going on? He said, I was there the second week, the preacher's average. Now God said, now there's preachers confirming it. Preaching's average. The pastor said, it's not about the preaching. He said, we can't explain it. He goes, but at the altar, something's happening. People are having encounters with God and lives are being transformed. And I believe today, friend, you come and say, God, I need sanctifying grace. He's going to hear you. Others are here in just a moment. You're going to come and the grace you need is grace to strengthen you. You're in a time in your life. You just say, God, I need your grace. Does it mean all the problems are going to go away tomorrow? Probably not. But he's going to transform you. He's going to give you the strength. His grace will strengthen you. And suddenly what you thought and what Satan meant to destroy you becomes instead something that builds you, makes you. Some of you need liberating grace today because you've been walking under condemnation. 
Satan has been telling you you are of no value and no account to God, and you believe that. And God wants his grace to liberate you. He wants you to experience the freedom of just being overwhelmed by God's grace.